we can come and have a seat. Um, so we'll stand up to pray to begin. So if you don't mind standing up to pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and the many blessings that you constantly provide for us. We ask that you give us a word of wisdom and a word of understanding and make us worthy. Pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thy kingdom and power, glory forever. So, if you can manage to take out your, your electronic Bibles, that would be good. <clears throat> There's just a couple of passages that we're going to go into today. So, we're going to scroll to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, if you can. If you're sitting in the back and you'd like to come forward, that would be nice. That way, I don't feel like I have to use the microphone too much, but... Claudio wants me to use the microphone. Okay, so we're in 1 Peter chapter 5, around verses 5 through 11. That's what we're going to start with today. Sorry, my voice is a little bit uh, shaky today. It's been a, a lot of travel, so I'm a little tired. <laughs> so 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. We'll start at verse 5. Is everybody there? We're, we're at a good place? Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But, if may, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we hear the words from St. Peter saying, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about seeking whom he, he may devour. This is an amazing imagery of this lion. Now, if you were having some camping trip recently um, uh, by a nearby lake, you don't really watch out for lions, right? You don't really look around thinking that there's going to be a lion. Because we're in California, we don't have wild lions uh, running around, as far as I know. So your guard is not up. You, you may see some wild animals. You might see some squirrel or some deer or maybe even a skunk or two, but you don't see a lion. Now, if you're going to, on a camping trip in Africa, yeah, that's a little different. You might prepare a little bit differently. You might go into the camping trip a little bit differently minded. You might still have the cookout. You might still have the fun and the fellowship with your family, but you might prepare a little bit differently. You would make sure that if there was a lion that came near your tent, that you would be ready. I hope so. I hope that we would all be ready for that kind of... So you're not going to let your guard down, in other words. You're not going to walk away even for five minutes away from your campsite if you know that there's a lion that may attack one of your kids. If you know that there are lions around, we have to be sober. We have to be vigilant. We have to be watchful knowing that there are prowling lions out there waiting to devour you and your family. Now, this is not the only place in Scripture that Satan is called a lion. In Psalm 91, which I'm not going to make you guys scroll to, but just note, in Psalm 91, uh, we read this prophecy of Christ. In verse 13, it says, You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. So we have in one verse, in Psalm 91, verse 13, we have in one verse, um, it brings all these images together. It calls the devil a lion and a snake. And it says that those who follow Christ will trample him under their feet. Not just, this is not just a, a battle for our physical lives, right? When we think about lions, we think about our physical lives. But it's a battle of our souls. It's a battle of eternity. So when the devil prowls 
and he's seeking whom he may devour, he's not just trying to kill our bodies. No, his goal is to drag you and your spouse and your kids and everyone else that he can into his dwelling place. So we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. We need to be watchful. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. So with that sort of sobriety in mind, I want us to imagine something very difficult, something almost devastating, okay? Stay with me. And I don't want you to just take my words for it. This mental picture that I'm trying to form, it comes from Scripture. Imagine Christ comes and he talks to you. I want you to imagine this is real, right? Like, I want you to imagine that Christ is, he approaches you. He walks towards you, right? He walks up towards you face to face, just like you've always dreamed of, I hope. You look forward to this moment every single day of your life. And finally, Christ is standing right there. And he's talking to you face to face. And our Lord looks to you and he says, For many years you've loved me. You said that you love me. And you have said that you are Christian. You're in the church every weekend. You tithe what you're supposed to tithe. You're working hard to bring the rest of your family to the church. You pray every day. You study the scripture. And he says to you, your religion is worthless. Your religion is worthless. How would that make you feel? After all that you've said, after all that you've done, if our Lord Jesus Christ looks me in the eyes and said, my religion is worthless. It cuts to the heart, doesn't it? It would be a fearful, scary thing to hear from the lips of God, those words. Now, according to scripture, religious, religion can be a very good thing. The book of James, which if you don't mind kind of going to that um, epistle, the book of James, Tell, the book of James tells us about pure, undefiled religion, which is pleasing to the Lord. If you look in verse 26 of chapter 1 of James, verse 26. So you're getting a sneak peek. So how much would it bother you if our Lord Jesus Christ told you that your religion is useless, it's worthless. If he looked at everything that we said and we do, and he told us that our religion is without any value, how devastated would we be? In chapter 1, verse 26, we're warned of a very dangerous sin, a sin that is so wicked, it's so vile, it's so destructive, that it can render our practice of Christianity to nothingness. It's because of this sin. So it's not a problem with the religion. It's a problem of us. It's, it's an us problem. It says in James chapter 1, verse 26, If anyone among you thinks that he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. I didn't write this. This is scripture. Those who consider themselves religious and yet don't keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. It's written in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. You see, it's not just killing and stealing and immorality that we have to guard against, that we have to be vigilant against, that we have to be sober-minded against, watchful. Satan would love nothing more than for us to be living in chastity your entire life and never kill a person, never hurt a fly, be an upstanding citizen, 
goes to church every single time the doors are open. And still we go to hell because we would not control our tongue. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is roaring, is a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour. What part of the lion's body is it that devours you? What part of the body of the lion? The mouth. I've never seen a lion devour anything with anything other than its mouth. But the lion is unique. Instead of using his mouth to devour you, he uses your own mouth to devour yourself. By getting a hold of your tongue, the devil devours our souls. He can destroy a family. He can destroy a church. We're going to look at a few uh, pieces of scripture in Proverbs and in James and in various places where we see from scripture itself, just how destructive the tongue can be. In Proverbs, we're told that the tongue is destructive to friendships. Let's see. It says, a perverse man sows strife and a whisper separates the best of friends. Also in, in Proverbs, the hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. In Proverbs again, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no talebearer, strife ceases. As charcoal is to burning coals, as wood is to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of the talebearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down into the inmost body. In James chapter 3, it says, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison, with it, we can bless God the Father, and with it, we can curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. In Proverbs again, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. This is all just in the context of friendships. All of these quotations are directly from, from Scripture, telling us that if we want to destroy a friendship, you don't have to steal one thing from them. You don't, have to, you don't have to lay a hand on them if you want to destroy friendship. All you have to do is open your mouth. You can destroy friendship that way. Scripture also says that the tongue is destructive to our brothers and sisters, whether in our family or in our church family. In James chapter 4, it says, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. In James chapter 5, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. So according to scripture, you don't strike your brothers and sisters. You don't have to steal anything from them. You don't have to physically hurt them in any way. If you want to destroy your brothers and sisters, all you have to do is open your mouth and speak evil of them. You want to hear the, the marriage part? If you want to tear a marriage apart, you don't have to commit adultery. You don't have to squander all the money. If you want to rip a marriage apart, all you have to do is open your mouth. Whether you're the husband or the wife, all you have to do is open your mouth and be quarrelsome, be nagging, be negative, be agitated. Using your tongue to tear down your spouse rather than building them up. According to scripture, the tongue can be destructive to the soul. Proverbs chapter 21 says, Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. And then we look at the, the verse that we've already looked at in James chapter 1 verse 26. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not tight, keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Using nothing but this little one muscle this little tongue, this very tiny part of our body, 
if we're negative, if we gossip, if we speak badly about each other, it can destroy friendships, it can destroy brothers and sisters, it can destroy family, it can destroy our marriage, it can destroy our soul with nothing other than the tongue. We can drag our souls to hell with our tongue. Why are the sins of the tongue so deadly? When you sin with your tongue by speaking badly about others, you are sinning against the truth. You are sinning against humility. You are sinning against love. You are sinning against relationships. You are sinning against the concept of repentance itself. I'm going to touch on each one of these. When you sin against the truth, when you speak badly about someone else, it's rarely a simple account of some fact that you witnessed. You add a story, you add to the story by, by judging their motives. We think we can read minds. We pretend that we know exactly why they did what they did. Whenever we judge incorrectly, our gossip becomes slander. And when we slander, we're speaking lies. So if you want to know what the motives are, ask. Be direct. And if you feel embarrassed by asking, then it's none of our business. So we don't, we don't try to read minds. We don't even do that with our spouses. We ask. You looked a little bit upset today. What's going on? Not, not, you were so mean to me because of this and this and this. You know, you know exactly what's going on. It could be a complete misunderstanding. So we have to ask the motives. We sin against humility. The reason that you can so confidently believe that you can accurately judge the motives of others is because we have a pride problem. We are way too sure of our own abilities. The truth is that we are not, I'm speaking of myself, we are not as smart as I think I am. You can misjudge another person's actions. It can happen. You can think that the other person is rude and unloving and angry and upset and you could be completely wrong. We have to stop trusting our cunningness, our ability to judge the hearts and the motives of other people. If you want to know whether we have, they have certain motives, then we humble ourselves enough to ask. We have to humble ourselves enough to ask. We're sinning against love. Scripture says that love keeps no records of wrong. Love is patient. Love is kind and seeks for the best interest of others. If we're running off at the mouth and tearing other people down, you are showing them hatred. You're not showing them love. You're not covering them. We're sinning against relationships. Christians are supposed to build close relationships between spouses and siblings and children and neighbors and fellow members of the church. By sinning with our tongue, it tears these relationships apart. Sinning against repentance. Walking with Christ requires repentance. But if you're spending time focusing on the sins of others, that indicates that we're not spending enough time focusing on my own sin. Stop confessing other people's sins. We have to start confessing our own. A lot of time when we speak badly about other people, when we spend so much time talking about how evil this person is or how evil that person is, how wicked that person can be, how terrible that person is, it's because we're terrified of being silent and looking long enough to turn our thoughts inward. Think about how well we measure up to Christ. I can talk about righteousness I can condemn sin all day long as long as it's somebody else's sin. But if I stop focusing on anybody else's sin, 
that doesn't leave anybody else's sin for me to consider but my own. I'm faced to look in the mirror and it's painful. It's humbling. It's not fun. It's not fun. But we cannot repent of our sins until we close our mouths long enough to discover our own sin. We have to focus on ourselves. Our sin detectors work very well when we're trying to seek out sin in other people. What we need to do is take that same ability, that same sin detector, and focus it on our own hearts. When we look at other people, we don't know the motives. We just don't. But if you look in your heart of hearts, you can look at your own motives. That's something you have control over. That's fact. You know that. If you're being honest with yourself. When you look at other people, you don't know for sure what, what they were thinking when they did the thing that they did. But you can look at yourself and you can know what you were thinking. That's fact. If you want to be a good judge of sin, if you want to have enough information to judge a person's guilty of sin, that person that we have to talk about and we have the most information about is ourselves. We could be excellent judges. You don't have to guess. You don't have to guess what you're thinking. You don't have to guess what your motives were. You can turn your sin detector inward. And you can see that we fall short in this way or in that way, then you could be confident that you have something in need to repent of. I'm going to wrap up my thoughts. We see that true repentance requires fruit. It requires action. We need to remember that repentance is far more than saying, I'm sorry. Repentance means that you literally turn around you start walking the other way, the opposite way. But if you fall on your knees before God because you're a thief and you say, God, please forgive me, you haven't repented because you, the things that you've stolen, you haven't given back. There has to be fruit. There has to be action. If you've walked down an immoral pathway with somebody who's not your spouse, and you say, God, please forgive me. You haven't repented until you turn back on that, you turn your back on that relationship. Something has to change. You have to go back to your spouse and you live a godly life, pure godly life with them. This is, this is the repentance, the action. So the same with our tongues. If we're cursing other men, and women, and we're gossiping against other people, and we are saying negative things about other people, we can ask God to forgive us all day long. But we haven't really repented until we take hold of our tongues. We ask others to forgive us. We have to not only stop using our tongues for wickedness and negativity, but start using them for the opposite. The people that we used to speak negatively of, are you intentionally speaking positive things of them? That's repentance. That's a change. Start building them up. Start drawing them closer to Christ. That's repentance. Have we started to use our tongue to start building up relationships? If not, then we have not repented. It says in James chapter 1, verse 26, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is useless, worthless. We have to take this, this warning seriously. We have to be sober. We have to be vigilant with our tongues so that Satan does not use it to devour your own family and your own relationships. And glory be to God forever. Amen. I want to open up to any questions or comments. 
great. Let's pray. <laughs> in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just one comment as you're sitting down. <clears throat> Just one comment. I know this was a bit of a straight talk. And sometimes we need straight talk. And I'm not accusing anybody of anything in the room at all. But sometimes we have to hear the straight talk. This is when, when Abuna was talking. About, I had a few I, um, options to speak about today. I, I didn't really know what I was going to speak about today until the sermon. When Abuna was talking about St. John Chrysostom. And St. John Chrysostom, to me, is someone who gives straight talk. Doesn't matter the repercussion. He was exiled. Doesn't matter. Wrong is wrong. We have to speak clearly about it. And he called out the empress, Eudexia. And then he came back and then it happened again. He called her out again. He called her like, um, uh, yeah, just, yeah, anyways. So um, sometimes in our faith, we need to hear the direct talk. And it, it's just like this example. Imagine that we had a heart problem and you have uh, options for two different types of doctors. You have a doctor that says, He's a surgeon, and he says, you know what? We're going to go in, and we're going to do this, and we're going to cut you open, and we're going to break open your chest, and we're going to get in there. We're going to put this uh, object in there. We're going to put the cameras in there. We're going to cut here. We're going to do that. And it's just, and you're going to be in here for a long time. There's going to be a lot of rehab, and it's going to be a lot, very painful, and it's going to be versus another doctor. Oh, you don't really want all that pain, do you? Well, I can give you some medicine for that, some pain medicine, and you could just rest and, you know, like, which doctor would you sometimes we need we need to if we want to be healed we have to hear it straight i would prefer the first doctor give it to me straight what is it what's the problem how do i fix this sometimes in our religion we get we get too uh, comfortable with the malish and things like that we we let a lot of things go and it's not a big deal and things like but there are certain things that if we're not paying attention to it can destroy a household. We have to pay attention to these small details. So, if you want to get things off your chest and, and start your repentance, talk to your father confession. We uh, Like, here at HCC, I know a lot of people confess with the Bunny David, a lot of the older crowd, right? <laughs> Not to say that you're older at all, but like, uh, you know, um, they confess with the Bunny David. And I hear a lot of people confessing with priests outside of the church, right? I hear this a lot. Oh, I confess to this priest over here and this priest over here. Good. I don't mind that at all. Like, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to get more customers. That's not, <laughs> I'm not trying to do that. But I, I am trying to say is that don't let that be a stumbling block for you. If, if you hold the line saying, I'm going to confess to this priest who is seven hours away and has a crazy schedule and I never see him except for like once a year. I mean, what are we doing? What are we doing? I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that me or Buddha David have a better schedule or anything like that. I'm just saying we have to take this a little bit more like, we have to take this a little bit more seriously. A lot of times when there's family issues that come to Abun and I, it's a blessing for us to get involved and, and to take care of as much as we possibly can with God's grace. But sometimes we're, we're getting it at the 11th hour when, when it's done, when it's like, like Abuna, where is the divorce paper? Like, you know, where is, we get it at the very end when we haven't even had a chance to even understand the story. Like where does this even start? Where do, and so what I'm trying to say is if we have re regular conversations with your father confession and you get some of these things off your chest and your father confession gives you homework and says, try this with your husband, try this with your wife. Don't talk to her like this. Don't talk to him like that. And you do it and you obey and we try and we try to work on things before it gets, before it gets too complicated, right? I'm, I'm not saying anything is too impossible for Christ, but I'm saying sometimes we just, we are at a disadvantage when we get it late when if we're taking preventative care, right? Um, when we go to the doctor often, uh, you can take your medicine often and we can be healthy, right? But if you wait too long and avoid the medicine and avoid the prescription and avoid that whole thing, 
then then it's emergency room and we have to deal with it in a crisis so um, that's just my 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 um, two cents there any questions comments uh there's a bunch <laughs> I'll, I'll send I'll, I'll give it to you right now any other comments or questions okay enjoy the the treats and the coffee <laughs>